when you and I take up this call and we talk about abortion, if we speak about it in church, we're told we're too political. If we speak about it in the political arena, we're told we're too religious. If we speak about it in the world of the media, it's too disturbing. In the world of business, it's too distracting. In the world of education, it's too controversial. In the streets, it's too disruptive. So abortion, if abortion is wrong, where do we go to say so? We go into the churches, we go into politics, into the media, into business, into education, and into the streets. Some churches, some churches haven't wanted, got, wanted to get involved in political hassles with the government, so they've been silent on abortion. They didn't want to get involved in hassles from the government. They didn't want to take the fight to the government. So now with the HHS mandate, the government took the fight to them. And when it comes to that mandate, we've got a simple message. We will obey God rather than men. As Alveda can tell us, her uncle said one day to the civil rights movement, we've got a lot of obstacles in our way, but we're not going to let anything turn us around. We're not going to let no dogs turn us around, no water hoses turn us around, no police clubs or jail sentences, and we're not going to let any injunctions turn us around. And so today I say to you, in the pro-life movement, no Planned Parenthood is going to turn us around. No biased media is going to turn us around. No HHS mandate is going to turn us around. No Obama administration is going to turn us around. for a certainty and it's not only the certainty that we will arrive at the day of victory for the unborn it is a certainty that the power which now dismembers them and crushes them and throws them in the garbage is a power which at its root has already been defeated well i'll tell you you know father frank it's amazing that we're actually sharing the stage with you um, Jason and I were kids. We met you in 1988. Yes. You look the exact same. <laughs> He's got the same hair, the same glasses, and the same outfit. <laughs> in, in 1991, there were, that was the, the height of abortion. It was 2,197 freestanding abortion clinics in America. Today, thanks to the work of Priests for Life and other organizations and Christians and Catholics joining hands and uniting for life, there are less than 600 freestanding abortion clinics Hallelujah. in America.
Well, good evening, friends. Father Frank Pavone here, National Director of Priests for Life. Welcome to The Light. Every Thursday evening, we talk about Scripture and pro-life. We delve into the Scriptures, which are the Word of Life, because Jesus Christ is life. And we see how literally on every page of the Bible, we are called to defend life, to promote life, to respect life, to love life, and in fact, to grow in the life of God Himself. So welcome. We're going to pray first, and then tonight we are going to talk about the biblical teaching on the image of God, human life, made in God's image. But first, let's turn to the Lord in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord God, you are life itself. You have given us a share in your life, and you have made us in your image, unlike the rest of creation, which does indeed reflect your power and your glory. But in terms of human life, you have given us, O Lord, a special privilege to know you, to have relationship with you, to have dominion over the earth, to exercise love, fruitfulness, and in fact, to share your very nature and to be conformed to the image of Christ Jesus, your Son. Bless us in Him. Bring us to the fullness of your image in the life of Christ that we share. And may we, the people of life, always protect our brothers and sisters, starting with and especially the youngest and most vulnerable, the children yet in the womb. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, where we start, of course, when we talk about Scripture and the image of God, is Genesis 1.27, which says that He created us in the divine image. The verse starts, God created man in His image. In the divine image He created him. Male and female He created them. This is indeed the, the first verse we look at because it's emphasizing the creative work of God and it's emphasizing that it was done in this particular way. There's something special about human beings. He creates everything else first, the light, the earth, the sky, the seas, the, the living creatures and so forth. Then the crowning of His creation is human life. And it's different from the rest of creation because he doesn't say that he made everything else in the image of God, but in the divine likeness he creates man and woman. Now, when, talk, when people talk about pro-life, this is one of the things, first of all, that we have to make sure that they understand. Some arguments, silly arguments, just like all the arguments in favor of abortion are silly arguments, and in fact they don't, need, they don't even deserve the, 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 the description of, of, of arguments. They'll say, oh, well, you know, life is continuous, you know, uh, everything is uh, uh, passed along from, from generation to generation, and all life is continuous because, after all, even the the sperm are alive and, you know, animals are alive and, oh, well, if we want to be pro-life, you know, don't, uh, don't kill the animals. And uh, they miss something very basic about the pro-life message. That we are talking about the dignity and sanctity of human life. And we are talking about the fact that there is a difference between human life and other forms of life. Furthermore, there's a difference between each individual human life and the life of a sperm or the life of that individual's mother or father. The beginning of a unique individual human life, which is you, which is me, which has a specific genetic set of characteristics begins at a specific point in time fertilization when there is also at that moment the creation of a human soul by God and that's a definite beginning it's not some kind of vague continuum 
nor is it a question of putting all life, all living creatures, on the same level. You know, uh, human beings are the ones who have museums in which we have, you know, prehistoric animals and we're the ones who write books about animals and we set up veterinary clinics. The animals don't write books about us or set up human clinics. There is obviously a dominance and a predominance of human life other, over other forms of life. Now, in regard to this, let's look for a moment at Psalm 8 because there's a beautiful passage here starting in verse 4. When I behold your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you arranged, what is man that you should be mindful of him, the son of man that you should care for him? Yet you have made him little less than a god, crowned him with glory and honor, you have given him rule over the works of your hands, putting all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yes, and the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fishes of the sea, and whatever swims in the paths of the seas. O Lord our God, how glorious is your name over all the earth. This is one of the aspects of us being in the image of God. It means a lot of things, and we won't be too technical here, but just draw out some of the ways in which people understand and celebrate the, the image of God in human life. But is that we have dominion. Obviously, we have dominion. You know, we hunt the animals, we cook the fish, and we, 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 we eat these creatures that God gave us. In fact, you see this in the book of Genesis also, where God gave Adam the task of naming the animals, and each one was given the name that he would call it. What does that tell you? tells you the same thing Psalm 8 is telling you, that there is a dominance of human life over other forms of life, because life is made in the image of God. We stand on our two feet. We stand erect. The animals go about on their four, four feet, right? We are standing. We are sharing the dominion of God. There is no dominion outside of that of God himself, he shares it with us, brothers and sisters. And this is one of the aspects of understanding that we are made in his image. Now, we know God. Now, creation, as Paul says to the Romans, reflects the power, the beauty, the majesty, the intelligence of God, right? I loved mathematics. I still do. It was my favorite subject in school. And I always tell people when they ask me my vocation story that I came to the priesthood through mathematics. Because as I studied math and my teachers allowed me to move ahead at my own pace because I always was going into the next lesson and the next lesson after that and way, way, way faster than the pace of the class, the further you go in math, the more abstract it becomes, and you learn these principles, and it's like, who, who made all these principles? You know, two parallel lines never intersect. Who decided that? And what if they did intersect, and what would be different? But then you get into concepts like infinity. Well, the concept of infinity is not that far from the concept of eternity, and so thinking mathematically led me to think philosophically, which led me to think theologically, which led me to consider more about God and pray to Him more, and actually drew me towards my ultimate vocation. But what I'm pointing out here is that in the um, uh, created universe, even though the universe reflects the intelligence of God and these laws and principles, of whether it's mathematics or physics or chemistry, there's built, built in principles, right, to the universe. Science and medicine make use of these principles. You know, think, for example, if you have to have surgery, you know, a doctor's going to go in. How does he know exactly where to cut if he's never cut into you before? How does he know where to go to find your appendix or your, you know, your liver or anything else? You know, there are certain laws that are, that are implanted in our nature so that we know how certain things operate. That's what makes operations possible. And so creation does reflect God. But you know what? 
It doesn't know God the way that human beings do. And this is reflected in a marvelous passage in the book of Daniel, chapter 3. I want to read for you this uh, hymn of praise, starting with verse 52. So Daniel is one of the prophets in the Old Testament. Chapter 3, starting with verse 52. Listen to this. Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of our fathers, praiseworthy and exalted above all forever. I'm going to skip a few verses. Blessed are you in the firmament of heaven, praiseworthy and glorious forever. And then listen to what it says. Bless the Lord, all you works of the Lord. The creation, the things He made. Bless the Lord. Now we're saying to the things He made. Bless the Lord, all you works of the Lord. Praise and exalt Him above all forever. Angels of the Lord, bless the Lord. Well, they know how to bless the Lord, of course. They're intelligent beings like we are. But then listen to this. You heavens, bless the Lord. All you waters above the heavens, bless the Lord. All you hosts of the Lord, bless the Lord. Sun and moon, bless the Lord. Stars of heaven, bless the Lord. It's as a command. It's telling them to do this. Every shower and dew, Bless the Lord, praise and exalt Him above all forever. All you winds, bless the Lord, praise and exalt Him above all forever. Fire and heat, cold and chill, dew and rain, frost and chill, ice and snow, nights and days, light and darkness, lightnings and clouds. Let the earth bless the Lord, mountains and hills, everything growing from the earth. It goes through this litany of created things. And why are we the ones to tell them to bless and exalt and praise the Lord? Because they don't have a spiritual soul. We do. They reflect the glory of God like every created thing does, but they don't have a mind to know it. The mountains don't have a mind. The rain doesn't have a soul, but we do. And because the mountains reflect the strength and majesty of God, we can take that and we can consciously offer the praise to God that the mountain embodies. Because the mountain can't make that offering. The mountain doesn't have a mind. The mountain doesn't have a will. The mountain can't say, bless the Lord, but we can. So we're like priests of creation, all of us. We're like a bridge of knowledge between the, the beauty and power of created things and the God who created them. So we know God. This is part of being in the image of God. You know what another part of being in the image of God is? We love Him. We love God. We can choose to love Him. Now, if I take a, a, you know, if I pick up an object and then I drop it, it doesn't have any choice but to go down. For that matter, neither do we if we were dropped from a, a, a particular height. But the fact of the matter is, we have a lot of other choices. We can choose to jump up. We can choose to walk from point A to point B. A rock can't do that. A book can't do that. An inanimate object can't do that. Inanimate means it doesn't have a soul. But well, because we have a soul, it's a spiritual soul, we can choose things. We can be faced with a decision to do A or B, and we can do one or the other. Image of God. What this means is that we can say yes to God, we can say yes to one another, we can love one another, we can love God, or we can choose the opposite, and that's a fearful power to have. It's scary, actually, that we have the power to sin, but we do. Book of Deuteronomy, what does it say? I have set before you life and death. In chapter 30, choose life then, that you and your descendants may live. Choose life, God tells us, because we have the power to say yes or no. There's another thing here. We love God and we love our neighbor. And in the very creation of us in the image and likeness of God, there's another dimension that comes forward, and that is the marriage relationship because he created Adam and Eve. Now, what does marriage represent? Ephesians, St. Paul writing to the Ephesians in chapter 5, says that marriage represents Christ and the church. 
And this was foreshadowed in the Old Testament in the prophet Isaiah and, and other prophets. But we start with Isaiah. He's most explicit when he says, God speaking through him, your maker, your creator, has now become your husband. God doesn't just make us like he makes the mountains and the seas. Your maker has become your husband. God enters into a covenant relationship with his people. You will be my people, he says multiple times in the prophets. You will be my people and I will be your God. We are made in the image of God. We are, I'm going to give you a Latin phrase here that the church uses. You know the word capable, right? Capacity. We have the capacity. So capax in Latin. Capable of God. Capax Dei. We are able to have a relationship with God that everything else he created is not able to have. We are able to say, acknowledge, know, love, choose to obey the creator and lawgiver of the universe. Blessed are we that we know these things. Okay, so the marriage we're talking about here between Adam and Eve represents the marriage between God and His people, even in the Old Testament. And then, of course, when Jesus came, He said, I'm the bridegroom. And then Paul, of course, develops this most fully in Ephesians and says, yes, there is a marriage. This is a great mystery, a sacramentum, a sacrament, a great mystery. Christ giving Himself away to His bride on the cross, giving His life, shedding His blood. So He said, that's the love that husbands must have for their wives. And wives, love your husbands like Christ loves the church. There's an indissoluble bond. Now, in love, in giving ourselves away, we as human beings are reflecting God. In fact, we're reflecting the life inside of God, right? The Father loves the Son. The Son loves the Father. The love of the Father and the Son is the Holy Spirit. And there's this trinity of persons. Perfect unity, there's only one God but a trinity of persons who love each other. The Father loves me, Jesus says. I obey the Father, He says. We send the Holy Spirit, He declares. This love, this is why in Matthew, Jesus says, let's erase some of this here, let's keep up uh, this uh, love God here, but in Matthew, remember the saying he gives us in Matthew 18, 20, where two or three are gathered, I am there in their midst. Now, Jesus is always with us. God is always with us, even if we're completely alone. But why does he say where two or three are gathered, I am with you? Because when two or three are gathered, we are able to express the image of God in yet another way, and that is by giving and receiving love. Giving and receiving love for one another, service, how can I serve you? I lay down my life for you. I care about you. The meaning of love, the meaning of life, giving and receiving love. That's an image of God. That manifests God. It manifests God, therefore, in the family, in the community, in the church, in our service to the world. We're, ma we're meant to give ourselves away to others just as Christ gave himself away to us. And this, again, is reflecting this marvelous image of God and that kapox day, that ability to have a relationship with God, to love Him, to enter into a relationship with Him, to share His very nature. Now, let's develop this just a little bit further, brothers and sisters. The fact that we're made in the image of God, and St. James reflects this in his letter, almost there towards the end of the Bible, you might remember in James chapter 3, there is the passage about the tongue, that we have to be uh, in charge, we have to be in command of this tiny little member of our bodies, but that can create a, a great fire. And then he says, after he gives 
this lesson about the tongue, comparing it to the rudder of a ship, he says this, The tongue is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. This need not be so, my brothers. But notice he uses the fact that we're made in the image of God to begin expressing the ethical demands of our relationships with each other. And certainly, if the fact that we're made in the image of God means that we are to speak well of each other and not curse other people, well then, brothers and sisters, how much more does it mean that we are not to kill other people? James chapter 3. Now, we're going to take this one step further because, and let me just uh, put these words here. Let's go to the red now. We are made in the image of God. This is true of our creation on the natural level. We share natural human life, natural level, okay? But then what's God's plan for human life? His plan for human life is salvation. His plan for human life is that we share supernatural life, the life of God Himself. Super means above, natural, our human nature. We're enabled, we are called to share a higher kind of life, God's own life, that life we described a moment ago taking place within the Holy Trinity. How do we get this life? Faith in Christ, baptism in Christ, right? We become, Scripture tells us, St. Peter tells us, partakers of the divine nature. I'll give you a couple of Scriptures. Partakers of the divine nature. Now, the reason we're bringing this up here is that as the creation of human life is according to the image of God, so is the salvation, so is the regeneration, so is the new life. And Scripture talks about this. It talks about it by saying we are made in the image and we are to be conformed to the image of Christ. Now, Obviously, Christ is God. But this shows us in a beautiful and consistent way the development of God's plan. He creates us, we are in His image, and then He calls us to share the image of His Son, who's God, the same God. But now that has a deeper meaning than creation. Now it means this new creation, this new life, this new image which really is the image of the very same God, but it's taken on this new dimension. Let's look at a few scriptures that, 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 that uh, and, and again, as I give you all these scriptures, by the way, in these, uh, in these sessions, you know, my hope is that you, uh, you take this down, and then you take your own time with the scriptures and reflect on and meditate on this more deeply by going to all these different passages. Um, in John chapter 14, starting with verse 23, He's sitting with his uh, apostles at the Last Supper. And he's talking to them about what's going to happen next after the, the crucifixion. He says, Jesus answered and said, Whoever loves me will keep my word. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our dwelling with Him. Now that is very powerful. We will come to Him. We will dwell in Him. God wants to make residence in us. He wants to live in us. 
And this is sanctifying grace, as we call it in our Catholic uh, teaching. Now, this conforms us to the image of Christ. And let's look at, just give you a few other scriptures on this, and that'll conclude our reflections. The image of God is Christ. The image of God, brothers and sisters, is Christ. And in that sense, you know, I always say everything in the Old Testament is a foreshadowing of the new. It's all pointing to Christ. It's all fulfilled. Every line of the Old Testament is fulfilled in Christ. And so when we read in the Old Testament that we're made in the image of God, even that too is a prophecy of Jesus Christ. Because let's read what St. Paul says in his um, uh, letter to the uh, Colossians. Let's start there, because this is one of the most powerful uh, examples of what I'm about to say. There is this hymn, this hymn to Jesus Christ in the first chapter of Colossians, which is actually a commentary on the first words of the Bible in the beginning, as we reflected on another le in another lesson. But listen to this. He, Christ, okay, is the image of the invisible God. Let me give you the reference here. It's Colossians 1, 15 and following. He is the image of of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in Him were created all things in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All were created through Him. All were created for Him. He is before all else that is, and in Him, in Him, everything continues in being. It is He who is head of the body of the church, he who is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, so that primacy may be His in everything. It pleased God to make all the fullness dwell in Him, and through Him to reconcile all things in Himself, making peace through the blood of His cross. So, brothers and sisters, Christ is everything in everything. Everything continues because of Him. Everything exists because of Him. And so in that sense, because all things were made through Him and for Him, all creation is a reflection of Him, which is really the same thing we were saying before. The mountains, the hills, the seas, the rivers, and human life above all. We are in the image of Christ, not only through creation, but through salvation. John, in his Gospel, tells us this powerfully right at the beginning of the Gospel. Let's go to John chapter 1. And in the 18th verse, what do we read? We read, No one has ever seen God, the only Son, God, who is at the Father's side, has revealed Him. Letter of the Hebrews, in the past, and we'll go to it, God spoke to our fathers in fragmentary and varied ways, through the prophets. Now he speaks to us through his son. The letter to the Hebrews tells us. And right at the beginning, Hebrews chapter 1, it says further, He is the refulgence of his glory, the very imprint of his being, who sustains all things by his mighty word. And when he had accomplished purification from sins, he took his seat at the right hand of the majesty of God, as far superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Notice what's happening here. Christ, the fullness of the image of God. In other words, we understand more about the image of God when Christ is revealed to us than we ever could before. And you know what that means? In Christ... And the Second Vatican Council, by the way, taught this beautifully. Not only do we see the revelation of who God is, but it is in Christ and only in Christ that we fully understand who we are. Why? Because we were made in the image of God. Christ is the full, perfect reflection of the image of God. So you want to see yourself? You want to look in the mirror? Look at Christ. When you look at Christ, you're looking in the mirror in the best possible way. Because He is the perfect image of God to whom we are to be conformed. 
I want to show you some other scriptures that powerfully teach this. The Book of Wisdom. The Book of Wisdom, starting in verse uh, uh, 24 of chapter 7. Okay, so Wisdom 7, 24 and following. Listen to what this says. Keep in mind, this, this, again, this whole theme of Christ being the, the image of God and us becoming the image of God even more in Him. Listen to this. Because wisdom, keep in mind, wisdom is the Word of God, which is Christ. So this book, written, of course, well before Christ came, nevertheless, points to Him and says, For wisdom is mobile beyond all motion. She penetrates and pervades all things by reason of her purity. For she... Now, when we read this in Wisdom, think of what we heard in Hebrews, think of what we heard in Colossians. She, Wisdom, is an aura of the might of God and a pure effusion of the glory of the Almighty. Therefore, nothing that is sullied enters into her. For she is the refulgence of eternal light, the spotless mirror of the power of God and the image of His goodness. And she, who is one, can do all things and renews everything while herself perduring and passing into holy souls from age to age. She produces friends of God and prophets. So it's not just that wisdom, the Word, Jesus Christ, eternally dwelling with the Father, is His perfect reflection. We look at Him, we see the Father, and we see ourselves. But it's also that He makes us Friends of God. He makes us, well, like we said before, partakers in the divine nature. He dwells with us. He does, again, going back for a second to John chapter 1, He doesn't only come and then He becomes flesh, but what does He do? To those who accepted Him, John 1 verse 12, He became power, He gave power, to become children of God, those who believe in His name, who were not born by natural generation, nor by human choice, nor by a man's decision, but by God. But by God. And that's what wisdom does. Now, there is a fascinating example of this in the life of Moses. I'm going to go quickly to Exodus, second book of the Bible, in uh, chapter 34, yes, verse 27 of chapter 34 of Exodus. And you'll remember this. Chapter 34, Moses, of course, was called to come up to the mountain to receive the commandments, right? Do you know he spent 40 days up there with God? communing with him. And what happened when he came down with the tablets of the commandments? Listen to this. Starting in verse 29. Okay, so Exodus 34. Oh, I didn't put your other verses here. Okay, so we had Hebrews chapter 1. And uh, so now we're going to um, Exodus 34. And we're starting in verse 29 and following. Moses comes down from the mountain. And it says, As Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the commandments in his hands, he did not know that the skin of his face had become radiant while he conversed with the Lord. When Aaron then and the other Israelites saw Moses and noticed how radiant the skin of his face had become, they were afraid to come near him. Only after Moses called to them did Aaron and all the rulers of the community come back to him. Moses then spoke to them. Later on, all the Israelites came up to him and enjoined, he, and he enjoined on them all that the Lord had sold him on Mount Sinai. But when he finished speaking, he put a veil over his face. Whenever Moses entered the presence of the Lord to converse with him, he removed the veil until he came out again. On coming out, he would tell the Israelites all that had been commanded. Now, this is a beautiful sign of the transforming power of God. Moses had access to God in a unique way. 
And it actually changed his physical appearance. He still, still clearly was Moses. He still had, you know, the fullness of his human nature. But his face, the, the radiance of his face, what was God trying to say there? Again, everything in the Old Testament is a prophecy of Christ and things in the New Testament. He was pointing ahead to the fact that when we really commune with the Word of God, see, God was sharing His Word with him, so Christ was in the midst of all that, shared His Word with him on the tablets of the commandments. When we commune with the Word of God, our nature is transformed. Wisdom passing into holy souls from age to age produces friends of God. Moses, the friend of God, conversing with God, and then coming to the people and telling them what he said. Second letter of Paul to the Corinthians. Second Corinthians picks up on this story of Moses. And if you go to chapter, uh, let's see where we're going to start here, chapter 3, verse 7. So 2 Corinthians, chapter 3, verse 7 and following, says this. Now if the ministry of death carved in letters on stone was so glorious that the Israelites could not look intently at the face of Moses because of its glory that was going to fade, how much more will the ministry of the Spirit be glorious? For the ministry of condemnation was glorious. The ministry of righteousness will abound much more in glory. Indeed, what was endowed with glory has come to have no glory in this respect, because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was going to fade was glorious, how much more what will what endures be glorious? So he's making a contrast, right, between the Old Testament and the New, between the Old Covenant and the New and Eternal Covenant in the blood of Christ. And therefore he goes on, Therefore, since we have such hope, we act very boldly, not like Moses who put a veil over his face so that the Israelites could not look intently at the cessation of what was fading, but rather their thoughts were rendered dull. Even to this present day, the same veil remains unlifted when they read the Old Covenant because through Christ it is taken away. So he's talking about you know, understanding that everything written before is a prophecy of Christ. A veil is over their hearts. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, Paul goes on to say, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. All of us, gazing with unveiled face on the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory as from the Lord who is the Spirit. And then he goes on to talk more and more about this. But you see, the same theme is being developed here. The Moses glorified face is a sign of what happens to you and me in Christ, being conformed more and more to the image that we already share by our ordinary human nature at creation. We are made in the image of God. But that image of God is also a calling. It's also a path, a journey, a development more and more from glory to glory, becoming more and more like Christ, and that lasts forever. Two final passages, Colossians 3 and Ephesians uh, 4, talk to us about the ethical dimension of this. Because, my friends, just like we saw in, in the letter of St. James, that the fact that we're in the image of God puts an ethical demand on others to respect us, to respect our lives, to respect our dignity, just as it puts a demand on them to respect us. So the image of God and being transformed into the image of Christ involves moral transformation on our part. So Colossians chapter 3 and Ephesians chapter 4 we're going to look at. Colossians chapter 3, let's see. Um, we're going to go to verse 10 of Colossians chapter 3, and we read. You have put on the new self. The new self, the new man. You have put on the new self, 
previous verse, he says, stop lying to one another. Since you have taken off the old self with its practices, now you have put on the new self, which is being renewed. And now listen to this, because here's our theme again. Which is being renewed for knowledge in the image of its creator. Colossians 3.10, the image. For here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all in all. As in, isn't that exactly what Paul had said two chapters earlier? He's all in all. Everything was created through Him. Everything was created for Him. In Him all things hold together. He is the perfect image of God, and we are growing more and more into that image, and therefore we've got to purify ourselves. We've got to cast off sin. We've got to stop lying. We've got to stop killing. We've got to stop being indifferent to the plight of human life. Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4 brings us the very same theme. It's a very parallel uh, passage, starting in verse uh, 17 and following. And we read, Renewal in Christ. 17 says, So I declare and testify in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their minds, darkened in understanding, alienated from the life of God because of their ignorance, because of their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have handed themselves over to licentiousness for the practice of every kind of impurity to excess. That is not how you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard of Him and were taught in Him, as truth is in Jesus. That you should put, and this is verse 22, that you should put away the old self of your former way of life, corrupted through deceitful desires. Be renewed, rather, in the spirit of your minds. Put on the new self, created in God's way, in righteousness and holiness of truth. What could we say? Isn't the, isn't the response to all of this just, wow, what a gift God has given us in human life. Because all this putting on the new self and being transformed from glory to glory and being conformed in the image of Christ who is the first and the last and the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, in whom all things hold together and for whom everything is created and who's the perfect image of the Father. All of this that we are privileged to live, the animals don't have this. The fish in the sea don't enjoy this. The plants don't have this vocation. Yes, all these creatures are alive. But it is human life, this crowning of God's creation, this awesome, awesome reality, sharing the very life of the Creator, telling all the rest of creation, bless the Lord. You don't know Him consciously. You can't choose Him because you don't have a spiritual soul, but we do, and we're bringing you in to this great chorus of praise to God that all creation, all creation has. We're bringing it in because we are human beings. We are sons and daughters of God, created originally in His image and growing in the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. Wow. Let's pray. Lord, we are in awe of human life. And Lord, we cannot think at this moment of anything but the gratitude we have towards you and the deep, deep privilege we have of welcoming every human life. Indeed, Lord, of bowing in reverence to every human life, no matter how poor or weak or sick, no matter how tiny, how young, how dependent, how frail, Lord, to the frail and to the mighty, to the big and to the small, to the one who is 80 years old or 80 days old in the womb, Lord, you reflect your own image and glory in every single human life. Increase our reverence 
increased our commitment to respect and protect every human life and to look forward to the day when we will all be united forever as your people in that new and heavenly Jerusalem where there is no more death. We ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you, friends, for joining this episode of The Light, Pro-Life and Scripture. May the Lord bless you now, strengthen you, protect you, answer all your prayers, and make you strong advocates for the unborn. May He bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father Frank Pavone here of Priests for Life. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Hello. I'm Evangelist Dalvita King with a very important message regarding the upcoming elections. On every level, it's very important that our leaders believe and live the mantra, in God we trust, and that we are and must remain one nation under God. Let's take it one step further and say that we should be teaching that we're not even separate races. We are one blood according to Acts 17.26 one blood and one human race. Abortion is such a threat to America, to the baby in the womb, to the health of the mother, to the relationship of the father and the mother, to the relationship of the family, and then every living and breathing community in our nation. The good news is that we each can do something about it. I urge all our followers across all communities to vote for life. Your vote matters. Go to ProLifeVote.com and get involved today.